Okay, I want to thank everyone for attending NACD's Fall 2021 Forestry Webinar Series. NACD's Forestry Resource Policy Group organizes two webinar series each year, uh, one in the fall and also one in the spring. Um, this session is being recorded and can be viewed later on on NACD's website and also YouTube channel. Uh, before we begin, I want to remind everyone, um, keep your audio on mute during the presentations. Uh, we will have a question and a, uh, answer segment at the end, uh, but I would encourage folks, if you have questions during the presentations, you can enter those in the chat function. I'll try to keep track of that, and then I'll moderate the Q&A session at the end. Okay, on to this, uh, this webinar, Forest Carbon Programs to Assist Private Landowners. Let me introduce the presenters for this session. Uh, Elizabeth Rannis works for the American Forest Foundation and is the Director of National Implementation for the Family Forest Carbon Program. She works with a team around the country to design and implement strategies to incentivize woodland owners to steward their land for carbon sequestration, along with co-benefits like wildlife habitat. Prior to her current role, Elizabeth has worked in forest conservation in the Northeast, fundraising and research. She holds a bachelor's in environmental studies and master's in public policy from the University of Virginia. And later, we also hope to be joined by Catherine Morse, uh, who's a landowner success manager for the Natural Capital Exchange, a carbon marketplace that connects net zero with forest landowners. She works to educate forest landowners on the NCX program through events, presentations, and direct outreach while managing relationships with thousands of landowners who have already enrolled in the NCX cycle. And so with that, Elizabeth, I'm gonna pass it on to you and let you go into your presentation. Perfect, thanks so much, Mike. Um, it's, it's really great to be here with you all today. Um, I'm really excited to tell you a little bit about the Family Forest Carbon Program. Um, so I, because I cannot multitask, let me go ahead and share my screen here. And let's see here, get it going. I do have a presentation to share with you all. All right, so. Great, right, you should be seeing what looks like the title slide of a presentation. Um, if, if you're not, just let me know and we'll get that fixed. Um, but anyway, it. so. Oh, fantastic. Thanks, Annika. Um, so um, like Mike said, my name is Elizabeth and I, I work for the American Forest Foundation um, as the director for implementation of the Family Forest Carbon Program. Um, I put my email up here and I would be super happy to hear from any of you um, if you'd like to partner, if you're curious about um, any, uh, any follow-up questions that you might have about the program, um, shoot me an email and, and I'd love to get um, in, in greater touch with you. Um, so with that being said, um, the agenda today, since I'm going first, um, I get to talk a little bit first about the role of natural climate solutions and the opportunity for private forest landowners. And then I'm going to spend most of my time today talking about the Family Forest Carbon Program, um, really providing an overview so that you get just a, a little bit of a picture of, of what our program is doing. So um, to start out with, I wanted to share um, a little bit about what the potential is in the US for um, land-based or natural climate solutions. Um, you can see that um, forests, well, uh, you, can't, you can't see this because it's only partially uh, part of the graphic here, but I'll tell you that forests play a massive role. Um, greater than we you know, thought five to 10 years ago, um, there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of untapped opportunity to sequester even more um, carbon and meaningfully um, mitigate climate change. So a lot of that opportunity is in reforestation. However, um, uh, reforestation is pretty expensive. Uh, you can see you know, the, the cost here, up, um, it's, it's quite a lot, not quite what our current carbon markets can really support. The second biggest area for, um, for that is nat natural forest management or um, improved forest, forest management, which is what the Family Forest Carbon Program is really focusing on right now. So um, massive opportunity there to both um, you know, benefit private family landowners and also to 
make a real meaningful impact on, on mitigating climate change. Um, uh, I, think, I think everybody on the call, most forest and land in, in the US. Um, <clears throat> next, I wanted to show this slide a little bit to demonstrate the potential of providing opportunities for smaller family landowners. So um, the gray bar up here represents where we actually see a lot of forest carbon projects um, taking place. And you can see that that is um, primarily only folks with greater than 5,000 acres can enroll in, you know, kind of more traditional carbon projects. Um, whereas, of course, most families own properties that are less than 100 acres. And so this, all this yellow, where it's not, um, all this yellow basically represents untapped potential um, and an opportunity to engage family landowners in um, carbon-friendly forest management practices. All right, so um, that was my quick intro about uh, Kind of why why we're doing this, and now I'm going to get into a little bit about the Family Forest Carbon Program itself. Um, so the Family Forest Carbon Program is um, what we call kind of a practice based program. It was developed by the American Forest Foundation and the Nature Conservancy to meet the challenges that many smaller acre landowners face when considering forest carbon offset programs, while also addressing some of the most common critiques of forest carbon credits, so that our program can be really meaningful for the climate and really be a sustainable long-term solution. Um, so like I mentioned on the last slide, uh, we do uh, um, adopt an approach that offers incentives for specific forest management practices that have been scientifically demonstrated to enhance carbon sequestration, um, while also addressing a lot of the resource concerns that might be found on in a particular geography. So you're gonna see that I'm presenting practices today that are um, gonna be applicable to the central Appalachians, uh, maybe not to the rest of the country um, because we really design practices according to what each area needs. Um, we engage family forest owners with natural resources professionals to provide technical assistance during site visits and through forest management plans that we offer to anybody that signs up with our program. Our program also promotes multiple benefits of forest management. So it's not all about carbon. We also promote timber production, wildlife habitat, and protecting water resources, um, and really anything else that the, the landowner might be interested in. We wanna work with them to help them meet their goals, whatever that might be. And um, finally, the program is built on a financial model that's scalable and uses funding from mostly private sources. So. You might have noticed TNC and AFF are nonprofits, and we, we do have some grants from, from government agencies to get us set up, but our, our financial model um, is a long-term sustainable model um, that actually we, we get funding from the carbon offsets that we sell to, to companies. So um, I wanted to put some key innovations that make the Family Forest Carbon Program different from a more traditional forest carbon project. So you, um, you remember the slide from before where it's a big gray bar and all the potential. Um, that was pointing to an issue that we have with traditional forest carbon projects and that they're not really set up to involve smaller family um, landowners. So that is where our project, that's where our program comes in. So the Family Forest Carbon Program, um, we, we help landowners by, um, paying them to implement specific practices that will be good for their property. Um, we, one of the biggest costs in a traditional forest carbon project is actually monitoring very detailed carbon values on each and every property. And that's really what um, prevents a lot of folks from being able to participate. So instead, um, we, we, um, we monitor practice implementation on every property, but in terms of the carbon values, we do that um, on a landscape level using random sampling. Um, and that reduces the average kind of per property monitoring cost. Um, we also, while, while most um, you know, traditional forest carbon projects require these super long-term contracts, 
um, which might turn a lot of landowners away, um, we, uh, we still are able to achieve permanence with the Family Forest Carbon Program, um, but we do that through sound intervention design, um, not through these super long contracts. Our contracts are 10 to 20 years instead of you know 100 plus. And then finally, um, we have what we call um, a, a extreme additionality. So uh, typically additionality um, or you know, carbon impact, real carbon impact is determined from a model baseline, but the Family Forest Carbon Program uses an observed baseline, which is updated every verification cycle, which gives um, us and gives also our carbon credit purchasers a lot of confidence that the, the carbon that we are, um, the, the carbon offsets that we are creating are really uh, meaningful, they're really real, they're really additional. It's, um, they're making a real impact for, um, for the atmosphere. Um, so how does it work for the landowner? Let's get into this a little bit. Um, so to start off with, I wanted to just provide a couple examples of uh, some landowners. I'll probably actually just um, do this one example because I don't wanna go over my time too much. <laughs> um, but um, this is John and Sylvia Dysart. Um, John is an auto shop owner um, who loves hunting. He was a member of a hunting club or has been a member of a hunting club for 55 years and eventually bought out his hunting club property. He loves to walk on this property, um, you know, see, see the deer and whatnot. Um, and he actually saw an ad on social media about the Family Forest Carbon Program and called to inquire about more information. Um, he, he really likes the program because um, the funding helps him um, you know, with his taxes and helps him, you know, um, reduce his expenses and doesn't mess with his retirement or what he wants to do on his property. Um, and so you can see um, a quote here. He's, he's such a great advocate for the program um, and has been really happy with it. Um, so that's just an example of um, one of the folks that has signed up so far. I'm going to pass this one again, just just for the sake of time and shift over here to how it works in the landowner. So um, we have designed this program to um, be both relatively simple to enroll in while also um, you know, recognizing what landowners really uh, need and what they really value. So um, landowners can go online, find their property or, or give us a call and we'll work them through the process. Um, they'll connect with a representative to answer their questions, and then we'll actually provide a site visit from a forester. So the site, the, the forester will walk their land with them um, and collect some data to help determine the payment rate. Um, after that, the landowner will receive that contract, um, review the rate, review, you know, all of the various things that they might need to do to, to be in the program, and if they're happy with it, they will sign it and receive their first payment soon after signing. Um, one thing that makes our, our program different is that um, we've modeled out how much carbon impact we think we'll be able, we'll, we'll get from the practices. And so we're able to reduce a lot of the risk that the landowner might take on in a different sort of carbon program because we actually can, um, you know, kind of provide them a guaranteed amount of, of money through the contract and also provide their payment upfront. Um, and then finally, depending on the practice, the landowner might need to hire a professional to complete um, complete the practice, um, or you know they might not. It all depends on what their practice is and what their goals are. Um, so just to get into a little bit more detail here, um, payments are made throughout the agreement period according to a set schedule. I mentioned that um, that'll all be set out in the initial contract, so the landowner will have full transparency on when the payments will come and everything like that. Um, the landowner will be responsible for reporting requirements every five years, so it's pretty easy to do. Um, the FFCP will own the rights to the carbon in the project area, and kind of aligned with that, we might visit the property to conduct monitoring in order for us to know actually how much carbon um, we can sell. And then finally, for current registry rules, landowners who participated in any other carbon project 
um, may not sign up. Um, even if their term with the other project has completed. So this applies to um, all projects for registry rules. It's, it's not an FFCP rule, it's, um, it's registry rules. So we do, um, we do always need to check for that. All right, um, next up here is late under eligibility. Um, I can't say a lot on this because it really depends a lot on the specific practice. Um, but in general, we try to make it as inclusive as we can in terms of eligibility. So um, again, we're targeted for smaller family landowners. So um, anybody that owns between 30 and 2,400 forested acres um, within one of our eligible geographies um, is eligible to participate. Um, they can't have restrictions on the land that exclude timber activity, timber harvest activity, um, because in those cases, our practices wouldn't be additional. And we wanna make sure that what we're doing is always additional. And then finally, um, like I mentioned, there are additional eligibility criteria depending on, on what the practice is that the landowner is most interested in. And the next question I, I always get is what are the practices? So I'm gonna mention a little bit about the practices in the central apps. I didn't see a lot of folks on the call today that were um, from the central app, so this might not be as relevant to you, but it should give you some sort of an idea of, of what we're going for. And you might see some similar practices as we expand into other areas of the country as well. Um, so um, in the central apps, we have two practices that we've designed to be compatible with most forest management goals. Um, given, you know, most forest management practices have the desired end goal of kind of letting the forest continue to mature or regenerating. Um, so in the case where the goal is to allow the forest stand to mature, we have a practice called growing mature forests. Um, growing mature forests uh, allows light thinning, but it restricts the amount of harvesting that can occur um, so that the highest quality trees are retained um, for the most part. We, we kind of also call it the no high grading practice because that's really what it was designed around and what the intent around it is. Um, now, if the goal for, of the landowner is to regenerate the forest stand, um, we have a practice called enhancing the future forest where um, the, the practice actually pays for controlling competing vegetation that might be suppressing um, tree seedling. So this is in the case where um, a regeneration harvest has already been planned or has already happened um, will help to make sure that that's successful by um, providing the support that landowners need to actually, you know, control that invasives and other competing vegetation. Um, so uh, current status and expansion plans. Right now, um, we are very active in the central app. Appalachians. Um, we are recruiting landowners all over Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Western Maryland. Um, we're pursuing verification of our carbon impacts under VERA's verified carbon standard and um, also recruiting needed market actors like carbon credit buyers, investors, and whatnot to make sure that our program is really um, long-term sustainable. And um, gotten a lot of a lot of buyer interest recently. So that's been great. Um, we also have been, um, like I mentioned before, researching practices in other regions and building models to enable us to scale. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, where we're going next and what that might look like. Oh, before I get there, um, this is where we are now. If you know landowners here, um, if you know anybody here, foresters who might be interested in um, the program, send them our way, and we'd be happy to um, get them going with next steps. And um, these are upcoming geographies, our most, um, most upcoming geographies. We have bigger plans to scale throughout the rest of the country as well. But right now, like I mentioned, we're in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Western Maryland. We'll probably get into Virginia as well. Um, we're also in, we're, we're not there yet, but um, early next year will be available, early to mid next year will be available in the Northeast. So um, Vermont, Massachusetts, um, and New York, probably a little beyond that as well. And then also in the upper Midwest next year. Um, and then um, we're also building out some potential practices and pilot area for the Southeast. 
So very exciting um, coming up where, where we're gonna be going. Um, so <clears throat> finally, just wanted to toss some partners up here um, to kind of show folks um, who we've been working with um, and give a little bit better of an idea for that. And then finally, I just have a final slide here um, with, again, my email address. I'll say again, in case, in case folks are arriving a bit late, um, I welcome lots, any emails if, if folks want to learn more or want to partner. Um, I, I would love that. So just, just reach out. That's my email um, or go online to our website and there's all sorts of information on there. And I think that's it. Um, Mike, did we get Catherine? Yeah, we do. Uh, Catherine, are you, uh, you all set? And yes. We'll, we'll take questions at the end. So, uh, all right, go ahead. Thanks. Perfect. Go ahead and share my screen. All righty. And uh, can you see the slides okay? Yes. I think it's going. Okay, great. Awesome. So yeah, thank you so much for having me, uh, Mike and Gary. Really appreciate all the coordination here uh, to allow us to present, you know, natural capital exchange and our forest carbon program that, you know, we're really excited to be able to provide to landowners. So um, my name is Catherine Morse. I am a landowner success manager at NCX. And, um, you know, I work with some state landowner associations, you know, other, other landowner groups, essentially, uh, you know, holding presentations, attending events, and just educating landowners on this new opportunity, um, this new kind of forest carbon opportunity. And then also, you know, working to help landowners day to day on the enrollment process and, um, you know, helping them uh, through the entire life cycle with the, with the carbon program. So I'm just going to go through you know, kind of what sets us apart from some other carbon programs that are currently, some other voluntary carbon programs that are currently available to landowners. And then I'll go through, you know, the actual enrollment process, some of the current dates for this current cycle, and then run through some frequently asked questions that we get from landowners. So just to start off, so, um, you know, the mission of NCX is really to put, you know, to pay landowners for all the ecosystem services that they're providing. Um, you know, forests provide trillions of dollars of value to society, but vast majority of that is not measured nor paid for. So uh, right now we're starting with forest carbon, uh, but, you know, we are going to move into credits about, you know, sustaining water quality, preserving biodiversity, mitigating fire risk, um, to name a few. So really excited to, you know, expand to those in the near future. Um, but, you know, we're again starting with forest carbon. So uh, we'll be talking about the, you know, forest carbon opportunity that we are providing as of now. So NCX is really built on our base map technology. So uh, we, we developed our base map technology with Microsoft in, in 2018, and this has really allowed us to, you know, grow this program at scale. So base map is the first ever high resolution forest map of the contiguous United States. So it allows us to estimate the size and species of trees on every acre of every forest in the US. Um, and you know, this again has really allowed us to, to grow the program at scale because we're able to do all of our assessments remotely. So you know, I'll, I'll go into you know, more of this in, in some future slides, but um, this really is you know, the foundation of our forest carbon program is this base map technology. So NCX, so our vision is really to build a carbon market that's available to every American forest landowner. So, you know, what we've seen in the past and what we've seen as of up until this point is that, you know, majority of some, you know, available carbon programs have barred participation to smaller family landowners. So, you know, NCX saw this, you know, need for a carbon program that can be built for, for every landowner, regardless of how, how big their property is. So, you know, and up until this point, you know, you can have contract lengths of, you know, 40 to 100 years. It could be high transaction costs to participate in a program and, you know, uh, basically large acreage minimums there as well. So we worked, you know, to develop a program uh, methodology and, you know, using that base technology to be able to provide 
you know, a, a carbon program that has no acreage minimums. I'll go on the side, no acreage minimums, and there's no cost to the landowner to participate. And it's only a one year contract deferral contract term. So it's only one year harvest deferral terms. And then just looking into some numbers. So um, we're currently in the 2022 winter cycle, um, but we've had incredible growth, you know, since we first started this carbon program. We actually had a pilot program in Pennsylvania in 2019. And, um, you know, we really worked, uh, we worked with Microsoft as the primary buyer in this, in this pilot program. And, um, you know, up until that point, uh, again, there hadn't really been a lot of, a lot of programs that uh, could be available to smaller family landowners, uh, but we worked with that and, and had, you know, tremendous success with that. And then we moved into our spring cycle of 2021, which was open to 10 states in the Southeast. And we had 119 landowners with bids accepted, you know, to participate that are currently participating. And then we actually expanded participation by five times that amount in the 2021 summer cycle of this year, uh, where we opened it up to the Lake States, uh, New York and Pennsylvania. And we had uh, 574 landowners with bids accepted. And actually from a climate perspective, uh, we went from around 100,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent in expected impact in our spring cycle this year to 500,000 in our summer cycle of this year. Um, and then just to you know, share a few other metrics not included in this slide is that landowners with as little as 20 acres have been assessed as eligible, uh, meaning they have enough you know, eligible carbon to, you know, volume to participate in the program. And then 45% of assessed properties in the summer cycle were under 500 acres. And on the bottom right-hand corner is just some buyers that participated in the previous cycles here. And, you know, these buyers are really, um, you know, large like Fortune 100 and 500 companies that are, you know, looking to offset their emissions. You know, they have high sustainability targets or net zero commitments and are, you know, purchasing these credits to, again, offset some of the emissions there. So in terms of NCX and our, you know, our climate impact here and making sure that we are creation, you know, creating additional carbon that's stored on the landscape, I have some kind of statistics here and, and a comparison here of NCX versus you know, some other legacy forest carbon programs that have you know, are kind of the differences here and how we deal with these key you know, pieces in, in measuring impact. So in terms of permanence, so NCX, we do have you know, one-year payment on delivery contracts. And this is actually bundled for the equivalent climate impact to one ton stored over 100 years. Um, and then, you know, uh, in terms of additionality, we use targeted acre by acre baselines to make sure that we are, you know, measuring that additional carbon. And then in terms of leakage, we really work to, you know, minimize this by increasing market access to all landowners because it's fully, you know, uh, fully accessible program to all landowners and not just the largest landowners. And then in addition to this, Leakage is addressed through, you know, enrollment of all of the acres of a property. And then we also apply a deduction factor based on regional statistics, as opposed to a standard leakage deduction factor. And in terms of, you know, certification of our credits, so we are currently working with Vera Carbon Standard, and they've actually fully, you know, approved our concept note but we are working on a full certification of our credits and are expecting this full certification by the end of uh, 2022. And, you know, this is really something that our buyers are really, you know, demanding and it's something that we're really uh, looking forward to completing this full certification of credits here. So I've gone over kind of what sets us apart, um, some, you know, the climate impact statistics and then you know, one thing of just how does this work? Like, how does the harvest for all work? So, uh, you know, our first step here is the measurement and enrollment step. So we use that basement technology to measure, you know, look at the standing inventory, uh, size and species of trees on every property. And then we also look at harvest risk. So we look at terrain operability, um, you know, proximity to mills, mill demand in the area of each property to determine the you know, risk that harvest will occur on that property in the upcoming year. We then, you know, give the landowner the assessment of um, how many credits that they can sell on the marketplace. 
And then that marketplace is that second step where landowners actually bid prices that work for them. And then buyers actually, you know, tell us how much they're willing to pay for these credits. And then we come to a market clearing price. And then the third step is, you know, that, uh, that harvest reduction step where we, you know, monitor audit, we, we do a second assessment at the end of that year long deferral term. And then we issue payments to the buyers and we issue sorry, pay, payments to the landowners. And then we issue the credits to the buyers, um, upon delivery of these, um, on delivery of these credits. And I might actually slip, skip the video just to give us some time here uh, for questions. But basically, you know, every individual has different motivations behind, you know, their reasoning for participating in the National Capital Exchange. Um, but some of the reasonings that we've seen are, you know, yearly income being a primary motivator for, you know, uh, uh, you know, besides just uh, kind of waiting for these trees to mature, you're getting that, you know, yearly income, that income year over year. Um, there's also many management practices that are permitted. Um, you know, we can we can work with uh, landowners that do invasive species removal, pine straw collecting, prescribed burns, to name a few. And you can also proceed with a thinning or a clear cutting as as you would like to. You just have to account for that in your bidding process. And then, yeah, by by deferring these harvests for a year, the timber value does increase for the next year as these trees grow in volume. So you have that you know increased volume as well year over year. Well, alrighty, and then just going into the schedule here, just these, you know, the steps for actual for landowners and the timeline for this current cycle uh, from now until December 1st is the enrollment period where landowners actually enroll all of their acres and then request the assessment from NCX. Uh, that second step is that assessment process where we assess, you know, eligibility for each property, looking at, again, standing inventory. Uh, the carbon storage potential, and then the risk of harvest in that upcoming year. And then in, um, it's actually currently at this point, once we assess your property, the seller agreement will be made available in the landowner account, where then you can actually submit bids to bid at prices that work for you. And then, um, you know, if you are accepted, if your bids are accepted into the marketplace, then you will enter into that year-long commitment for this current cycle, it is January 1st to December 31st of 2022. And that is, you know, that year-long commitment to defer however much harvest you said you were going to defer, you know, during that bid submission process. So that year-long deferral. And then um, at the end of this cycle, at the end of each cycle is the payment period where again we verify that these commitments were met. And then we issue payments um, to, to the landowners and issue these credits to the buyers. So signing up for an assessment only takes a few minutes. Basically, landowners just visit this website here to create their landowner account. And then, you know, all we need from them is just general contact information and just general property boundaries. We actually don't need any management plans. We don't need information about your past harvesting activity or future harvesting activity. We just need to take full stock of the land holdings under your ownership. Um, and, you know, basically to assess, you know, all of the standing uh, standing inventory and measure the amount of carbon that can be stored on that landscape in the upcoming year. And then um, basically from there, yeah, we just assess the property. And then, um, you know, the, the next steps are the auction process and then the actual fulfillment period. So just jumping into some really, you know, common asked questions that we get from landowners. You know, if a landowner needs to enroll all the property under their ownership, does that mean you have to defer harvest across your entire acreage? So no, so you're not actually, you know, required to bid on all of the credits that are given to you. Um, basically, and I mentioned this previously, but a scheduled thinning or a timber sale can continue as planned. You just have to reduce your bid accordingly. And um, regard, you know, with regards to removal specifically, this formula here is something that we provide, you know, landowners for guidance in terms of how to account for any removals that you assume will take place over that year long period. I uh, use this 25 tons of, of pine or 19 green tons of hardwood, about one truckload of merchantable timber is equal to one credit. And then you adjust your bid down based on what you expect will happen in that upcoming year. So how much will a landowner get paid per acre? So 
This isn't a super uh, straightforward answer because there's so many factors that influence financial potential here. And there's so many factors that determine how many credits the landowners allocated. You know, uh, so many factors play into this, this, uh, this calculation here, like rotation age, species mix. Uh, we look at, you know, timber economics. We look at, again, mill demand in the area um, and some other commitments. Uh, so it really depends how many credits that you do receive. And then in terms of the price per credit, this is determined in that auction structure uh, where we do, you know, match supply and demand to come to a market clearing price. And that price then determines the price per credit. Um, but it really does depend on, again, how many credits you receive in that market clearing price. Um, but the last cycle had a market clearing price of $12 per credit. And we're in the current cycle now where we're, you know, uh, still kind of looking at what that market clearing price is going to look like. But our main recommendation to landowners is just to get sign up for that free assessment, that original, you know, uh, uh, eligibility assessment, and then you'll receive the amount of credits that are allocated to you to determine, you know, um, how many credits you'd be willing to sell and if the process is, you know, uh, worthwhile. And so how should consulting foresters engage with the program? So we get this question a lot. Um, a lot of foresters that we've been working with have been handling NCX in ways similar to how they would handle a timber sale. Um, we actually also have an affiliate program available where you can get access to our multi-account dashboard, um, you know, being able to manage all the accounts under, under one dashboard instead of creating individual accounts for the landowners. Um, we can also do one-on-one -on -one webinar opportunities to the landowners you work with, um, a compensation package included in this and some other resources that you can share with clients. Um, so if anyone is, you know, has a forester that you know, or, you know, uh, is a forester themselves and is interested in getting more information, I have an email at the end of this slide where you can reach out to us uh, with any information about that. So kind of uh, went through everything quickly just to make sure we have enough time for questions, but um, really appreciate the opportunity to present our program to you all. And I have the email here for how to reach out to us. My colleague Lillian and I are both cust uh, landowner success managers, and we, you know, primarily man this this uh, email here. So you'll receive a response from us soon after after reaching out with any questions. And then this is the actual link to for landowners to create accounts. And this is the again those key dates for the current current cycle that's ongoing right now. So yeah, just open up to, to questions. Excellent. Okay, well, I think we had a couple of questions or people tried to chime in before. Um, Doug, did you have a question? Yeah, and this one's for Elizabeth. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you both for the presentations. Um, the forest practices you mentioned are applicable here in the Pacific Northwest, too. I didn't see anything that raised any eyebrows, and it would depend on the individual, individual landowner, of course. And thinking about the example from Pennsylvania and how highly the gentleman spoke about the program, what are any reasons why people wouldn't want to participate? Yeah, definitely. Um, so one of the things we hear a lot is um, uh, if, if folks are going to be selling their properties soon, um, then they might choose um, not to participate. Um, similar, like we, we do have a 20 year contract for that for the, for the most popular um, uh, practice. And so folks um, sometimes see that and if, if they don't, if they have plans to sell or don't know what their future plans are, um, they might choose not to. Of course, there is an out to that. Um, their landowners can, can get out of the contract, but I can definitely, um, that can definitely dissuade some folks from participating. Um, that's probably the one that we hear, that we hear most often. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for letting me know as well that um, the practices would be applicable in the Pacific Northwest as well. I, I would love to get there. Um, I uh, I think it's, it's a really important part of the country for for us to get out to for for this for this mission. It's supposed to stop raining in about five years. <laughs> I'll come then. <laughs> yeah, we have severe flooding right now. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, Gary Blair also has his hand up. Go ahead, Gary. 
Yeah, thank you. And I want to thank both of our presenters today, Elizabeth and Catherine, and appreciate that. Elizabeth, uh, same thing in the Southeast. I'm in Mississippi, and uh, I've heard a lot about your program. Really excited. I, I really like uh, a carbon-based program based on practices that are are really good for the not only the the landowner but also just for the land. And Catherine, um, you know, I, I am actually signed up for the program. Uh, I'm in the process right now, and I, I just want to say it's been a very good process. Um, I look forward to actually uh, submitting my bids here in a few days, and and. Uh, you know, I think it's just another opportunity that uh, forest landowners can look at both uh, the AFF program and the NCX program as a way of managing their timberland in the right way and then, uh, you know, getting some benefit and payment through carbon um, work. So I uh, commend both of you for what you're doing and thank you for your time today uh, as well. Thanks, Gary. Linda, did you have a question? Uh, yes, I do have a question. Uh, thank you very much, Elizabeth and Catherine, for the excellent and informative presentations. Uh, it's much needed information. Um, I have a question, uh, maybe more directed to Elizabeth. Uh, is it possible to uh, enroll in your program in conjunction with NRCS practices? For example, my my 200 acres is under contract with NRCS for things like timber stand improvement, mass tree release, the sessional forestry, um, and, the, and the like. Can they, these be done in, in, in concert with each other? You had a mature forest pro, uh, practice, which kind of is similar to those first two. Yeah, yeah. so the short answer is yes. Um, <clears throat> the long answer is um, we're happy to look at, at those specific cases where those will come up. There are cases where you might be under contract to do something that our agreement wouldn't necessarily allow, which in case, of course, you know, um, most likely wouldn't make, be able to make that work. But in most cases, um, you know, our, our contract is, is longer than the NRCS contracts. So, um, by enrolling, you know, you can enroll in the NRCS contract and, and also um, then enroll in the Family Forest Carbon Program um, and, uh, and it still be, still be additional and, um, and still be allowed to enroll. Um, I always encourage landowners if they're interested in NRCS and foresters to just um, have that conversation with us. Um, to make a fully informed decision, um, just in case there's any little things that that might that might come up that might be in in conflict. But typically, we've seen um, with the folks that are either signed up with NRCS or interested in NRCS, um, the programs work really well together. Catherine, do you want to touch on that from your program at all? Any conflicts or anything? Yeah, so basically in terms of, you know, our, our only really main kind of stipulation regarding other other programs or types of programs that a property might be under would be regarding like easements that a property was also under. So um, our main rule of thumb there is that if an easement restricts harvesting activity on a certain area of the property, then uh, we would recommend just not enrolling those acres in, you know, in terms of your enrollment of the property. So that's the only really kind of stipulation in terms of the yeah, other types of programs. Um, and um, yeah, that's just to prevent that, you know, if there's already something that's restricting harvesting activity, this would, uh, we want to make sure we're creating additional carbon stored on the landscape. So that would be an issue with additionality. Um, and then in terms of other carbon programs, um, yeah, we're still looking into just kind of what that looks like afterwards, like after our, if someone participates in the program, um, they can participate in other carbon programs right afterwards. But as of now, we're not seeing that there's any issue there in terms of, you know, of course, not, not in the same year, um, but in uh, another year moving forward. Yeah. Thank you both. Yeah, so, thank you. Do we have any other questions? Anybody have anything else for our presenters? Okay.
Well, seeing none, I, I want to thank uh, Elizabeth and Catherine for sharing time today. Obviously, this is an emerging topic, something all of our organizations are really exploring and, and something that uh, NECD and conservation districts are taking a close look at and seeing where we can fit and, and support um, private landowners uh, looking at these types of options. But thank you again. I should mention uh, this, this, will be, this recording will be on the NECD website and also our YouTube channel. And I encourage people to look for our next round of forestry webinars uh, in the spring, sometime in the spring of 2022. But thank you everybody for attending today.